Um, I asked Tom Brady if he'd like to come and give a lecture on playing football after the age of 40. Um, but he, uh, he politely declined and suggested a, an excellent alternative, uh, who was Tom Braden. And Tom will speak on the top heavy conjecture for vectors and matroids. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm happy to be here in quotes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm still holding out hope that I'll show up at IAS physically later in the semester, but we'll have to see how it goes. Um, yeah, okay. So um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a question in sort of pure combinatorics, which uh, ha has a solution that involves sort of difficult algebraic geometry. And then uh, the work that I'm going to talk about that I was involved with is uh, was the process of removing the algebraic geometry. So, so sort of simulating the algebraic geometry without using, without actually using it. So, uh, okay. So uh, to begin with, I'm going to just start with uh, a, the basic version, a very simple version of the question, which is uh, if you've given n points in in the plane, uh, how many lines can they determine? Um, and 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 to to remove trivial cases, assume that the points actually span the plane, so they're not all on a line. Um, and so, you know, for in, in, uh, you know, in this, in, in this example here, I have, uh, you know, six, six points, uh, and defining seven lines. Uh, and there, you know, if you, if you ask this question in general, there's an obvious upper bound, which is you can have at most n choose two lines to, uh, determined by n points. Uh, but the lower bound is, uh, considerably more, more subtle. Uh, and it turns out in uh, 1948, uh, De Bruyne and Erdos proved that uh, there are always at least n lines. So if you have n points in R2, there, there, there's always at least that many lines that they determine. So in this case, you know, seven is greater than or equal to six, which is, which is correct. And uh, equality is certainly possible. Uh, you can, if you just have all, all the points on one line and then one point off the line, and then they'll determine uh, exactly, this, exactly the number of points and lines are equal. Um, so. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so then this, this question has lots of natural generalizations and the first level of generality I want to, to um, uh, actually, before I move on to the next slide, let me just say, I'm trying to monitor the chat, but feel free to yell out if you have questions. Um, also to stop me from moving slides too quickly, um, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's, it's, it's sort of, I, I have some experience giving talks like this, but not, not a whole lot. So. Um, okay, so uh, so so now we want to generalize this, and and the and the the first level of generalization is to first of all allow arbitrary dimensions, not just the plane, and also we can work over different fields. Uh, you, you don't have to work over over R, and so the, the the first natural generalization would be the statement that if you have and 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 I also sort of uh, deprojectivize it rather than looking in, in a sort of affine situation. I'll look in in a, a sort of vector linear algebra situation. So if you have n vectors that span a d-dimensional vector space over some field k, uh, you can ask how many hyperplanes, how many d minus one dimensional subspaces they span. Uh, and uh, and, the, and the, the statement would be that they determine at least n of them. So there, there are at least as many hyperplanes as there, as there are vectors. And so, yeah, so I, I have a picture here showing, yeah, what sort of what I'm doing by linearizing it, uh, that, that, that's harmless. It just, it just sort of makes it, fit, fits it into linear algebra rather than uh, sort of affine geometry. And the statement is true. Um, it was proved in a couple of steps. Uh, and and there's, there's more than this. This is just a, 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 a subset of the papers people have published around this, around this topic. But in 51, Motzkin showed that this was true for any dimension, but working with, with still with real, uh, the real field. Um, and then in 68, Basterfield and Kelly uh, showed that it was true for any field K in any dimension. Uh, and then there was a, a sort of sweetening of the result in 1970. Uh, Green showed that not only do you have this, this inequality, but there's actually, there's always an injective map that sends points to hyperplanes uh, such that the point is contained in the hyperplane that it matches to. So you can always, you can always, you, you can always choose the hyperplane that contains, contains each point. Uh, such that you never choose a hyperplane more than once. Um, so that, that's a stronger, a stronger state. 
Any questions? Okay, so so the ne the next the next kind of generalization you can look at is is not just uh, one dimensional and d minus one dimensional subspaces, but you can look at subspaces of any dimension. And just to introduce some notation, um, I'm going to be choosing choosing a, a finite spanning set of this of this vector space, um, and uh, and then a flat is just any vector subspace spanned by some collection of your vectors. So we were looking at you know one dimensional spaces and d minus one dimensional spaces, but now we can look at subspaces of any dimension. And then you can collect all the flats, all the different spaces that you can span by your vectors into a, a finite partially ordered set ordered by inclusion of subsets. Um, and it's a ranked partially ordered set where the rank is just the dimension of your of your uh, the space that you're spanning. And um, uh, and, and and actually, if, if you look at the pictures on the bottom, uh, I, I, I'm actually on, on the right. I'm doing something which I'm going to do is ra rather than rather than talking about the subspace that they span as a vector subspace, I'm going to list the vectors contained in that space. So so here, rather than saying the vec the space spanned by one, the vector one, I'm going to say, you know, I'm just list list one and one two three is a flat because if I if I include one and two then three depends on one and two. So the, the space spanned by it contains all three. So it combinatorializes it. So you basically think of it as a set of, uh, a set of subsets of a finite set rather than vector subspaces. Uh, and when I get to matroids, that, that, that's sort of where the abstraction comes in. Um, and so you want to count the number of these, of these subspaces of any given dimension or any given rank. Uh, and and these, are, uh, these are called the, the, the Whitney numbers. The jth Whitney number, uh, it's strictly, I think it's the Whitney numbers of the second kind, but anyway. Um, but for, for us, we'll only talk about one of them. So the jth Whitney number is the number of J dimensional or J rank subspaces that you can span from this finite set of vectors. And so we're interested in inequalities among these, among these numbers. Okay, so uh, a theorem uh, from 1974 proved by Dowling and Wilson uh, says that there's more stuff on the bottom of this partial order set than on the top. Uh, more precisely, uh, if you are less than the middle degree, then the number of less than the middle uh, dimension, then the number of uh, the number of flats of dimension less than or equal to that is less than or equal to the number of flats, uh, the same number of dimensions, but going from the top down, down to the middle. Um, and, and they made the stronger conjecture that, in fact, actually the number of j-dimensional j subspaces is less than or equal to the number of d minus j-dimensional subspaces. So that would certainly imply the, the theorem that they proved, but it's, it's, it's definitely stronger, and they didn't know how to prove it at the time. Um, so I, I think there, there was some intermediate results on this, but the, but the, the real breakthrough came in, in 2016. Uh, the theorem was proved in, uh, by Jun He and Botang Wang. Uh, as a consequence of applying some uh, big, heavy technical machinery from algebraic geometry. Um, and I'll discuss some of the steps of that proof uh, in a little bit. Um, so that, so, 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 so th 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 this is now a theorem. Um, and I'll just make a remark that uh, actually, in fact, the, so the, the inequality that I wrote here is sort of symmetric, where I take j from the bottom and d minus j from the top exactly symmetric around the around the middle but in fact you you can get a stronger a stronger statement for free um, that in fact uh, the number of i dimensional subspaces is less than equal to the number of j dimensional subspaces for any number j between i and the complementary and the complementary uh, degree the complementary right um, I, I should I should be a little careful actually I should say you, you get this for free if your field is infinite uh, so if if the field is infinite. Because basically what happens is you can, if you have an arrangement of, of vectors that gives you a certain partial ordered set of, of flats, you can truncate, you can remove all of the d minus one dimensional flats by projecting in a sort of random direction. And if you project in a random direction, you get all, all the lower dimensional flats survive and only the ones that are d minus one dimensional get squashed down. And, um, and then you, if you apply the theorem to that post set inductively, you get uh, 
you get this stronger inequality. Okay, any questions? Okay, so, so just a little bit about how this, um, how this theorem was proved, not sort of all the details, but what they did is they, they sort of, uh, well, they, 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 rather than finding an injective function or, or def, you know, pr producing inequality directly, they use linear algebra. So they just, they, they defined a vector space. Uh, so just sort of naively, just define a vector space, just define, uh, you know, abstract uh, basis vectors, y sub f for each flat and collect all the, all the, all the vectors um, of rank j into one vector space so you get a base, a vector space with basis spanned by the flats of that dimension, uh, and and but it turns out that this is not just an abstract vector space. You can turn it into a graded ring, um, and the multiplication they, they call this the um, put this in. This is the, they call this the a graded Mobius algebra. And the multiplication is if you have the, the basis element corresponding to a flat F and a flat G when you multiply them, if the flats are sort of transverse to each other, that this, that's the total span is, has the dimension, the sum of the spans of, of the two flats you started with, then you just get that element, otherwise you kill it. Uh, so it's sort, of, it's sort of, if you want it to be graded, this is kind of a reasonably natural, uh, natural multiplication. And uh, so this, you, this turns out to be a, a commutative associative, associative ring. And they show that if you take a, a nice element in degree one, you take uh, a span of the elements in degree one, uh, which um, you take a span of the elements in degree one where all the coefficients are positive, uh, then when you multiply between degree j and degree d minus j, you, you get an injective map. And that proves the theorem because the dimension of the j dimensional piece is wj and the dimension of the d minus j dimensional piece is wd minus j so you have an inequality that you want um and in fact as a bonus that actually shows you the sort of set theoretic version the, the matching version it shows you the, it, it also proves that you get an injective map between f uh, uh between flats of of dimension j and flats of dimension d minus j uh such that they're always comparable um because if you look at the matrix of this multiplication map, uh, you can find a non-zero minor, and that non-zero minor has to have a permutation within it that's that's uh, that has a non-zero element on every in every element of the permutation, and uh, and because of the way this multiplication works, if you have a if you have a multiplication that's non-zero, there has to be a comparable the, the, the flats have to be comparable. So so you just look at you just look at this the, the form of this matrix and you get that extra stronger statement for free. Okay, so now the question is, how do you actually prove something like this, um, to prove that, that a map like this is injective? And it's, it's similar to statements that you see uh, uh, in the topology of algebraic varieties, and that's, that's sort of where they went with this. So, um, so what they do is they interpret this ring, they, they, they realize that this ring is actually the cohomology ring of a certain algebraic variety. Um, and so, in this, in, in, in this instance, I'm going to describe the algebraic variety purely as a topological space. It's a little easier to do that, but, um, but you can, it's not hard to describe as an algebraic variety. Um, and for simplicity, I'm going to think about working over the complex numbers. Um, you can do this over other fields for the experts. If you use a tau cohomology, everything I'm saying still works. Um, but for simplicity, let, 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 let's, assume we're, let's assume that our, vector, our, our vectors are over the field of complex numbers. So what you do is you sort of dualize. You you take these you take these this finite set of vectors, and instead of thinking of those vectors in c in c to the d, you think of them as linear functions on c to the d. Take the you know standard pairing, and uh, and then the sum of all those linear functions gives me an injective map into uh, sorry there are n vectors sorry v one up to v n that's a typo. One of the nice things about this compared with Beamer slides is you can fix them on the fly. Um, so, uh, so you get an injective map uh, from a, a d-dimensional space into, into Cn, and, you, and I'm going to call its image V. And, and what I'll do, do is just take the closure of this vector subspace V 
uh, this d-dimensional subspace V inside the product of P1s, P1 to the n. So we have C to the n sitting inside P1 to the n. You just put it in a pointed infinity in each of the coordinate directions. And, um, and then you take the closure. OK, so, uh, so, th so this is a, 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 a fair, fairly nice variety. It's actually not so hard to write down equations and, and sort of do all the things you want to do with it. Um, one very nice thing feature it has is that it has a, a group acting with finitely many orbits. So V itself is, is a group under addition, and that addition extends to, the, extends to an action on the closure. And, and there'll be finitely many orbits where V is one orbit and then the, the points at infinity split up into finitely many classes. And those classes end up being indexed by flats. So the flat, so the, the, uh, the set of points in this variety where the, uh, where the coordinates I, where the coordinates YI are equal to infinity are, are, are often that infinite direction. Um, it, it's basically the complement of that is always a flat. And, and so you can collect all of them together uh, all the ones together that have that pattern of, of infinities. And, um, and, and and the collection of all points that have exactly those entries infinity is in fact an affine space of dimension the rank of the flat. Um, so, uh, so, so you get a very combinatorial decomposition or stratification of this of this space that sort of naturally gives you a picture of, of the um, of the partial order of set that you're that you're interested in, and it turns out that that, that this uh, graded Mobius algebra H of V is actually the the cohomology ring of this of this space of this variety, uh, with degrees doubled. Um, but I'm going to sort of ignore that. So it's 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 doubled because uh, this this is basically a um, I mean the the cells the, the strata Y sub F are complex space to some dimension, so they're as a real space they're R to the twice the dimension. And so they're all even dimensional. And so you have a, a cell complex with even dimensional real cells. And, and, and the fact that these are isomorphic vector spaces is basically obvious because the number of cells of a dimension is the number of flats of that rank. And so, um, and so yeah, so, so, the, the, so the dimensions of this cohomology should be exactly the, the Whitney numbers counting the, the flats. Okay, but the, multi the mul multiplication, the fact that this, the mul this multiplication is correct is, is more interesting and there's uh, interesting ways to see it either using equivariant cohomology or, or you can actually define explicit cycles, even though it's a singular space, you can define explicit cycles whose inter intersection pattern uh, follows, the, um, uh, follows the rule of, of the multiplication of this. Okay, so, so now we have a space and we have, we have this ring and you wanna see is the multiplication of the cohomology of this, of, of this, of this ring have the, the, the correct property. Um, but first, actually, let, to, to, to give you a sense of how this variety is put together, I wanted to give you a quick, quick example to sort of see how you can navigate in this, in this space. So let me, take the, let me take the example where V is uh, points in C3 whose sum is zero, so a two-dimensional subspace of C3. Um, and the corresponding lattice of flats is, is, uh, is this, this very small rank two post set with three elements in, in degree one. And the picture of the variety is in the, in, in the center, in, in, as an open piece, you have the, vec the original vector space, two-dimensional vector space V. And it's, it's, it's basically a two-dimensional vector space, but I have naturally um, distinguished subspaces given by when the coordinates are equal to zero. X1 is equal to zero, X2 is equal to zero, X3 is equal to zero, give me an arrangement of hyperplanes in this space. And if you go off in, toward infinity from V, it depends on which direction. If you travel in a direction that's parallel to x1 is equal to zero, then you end up on a line which is sort of the quotient of that space by that direction. And it also has a distinguished point in the middle. Or if you travel off in a direction where x2 is equal to zero, you'll end off on, on this line. If you travel off in a direction where x3 is equal to zero, you'll end up on this line. If you travel in a random direction that's not in any of those hyperplane directions, then you end up at the smallest point, which is infinity, 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 where all points will go to infinity simultaneously. So, you know, given that you can sort of sort of see how to navigate, but it's more interesting to see that at infinity the space is actually singular, even though it's built up out of out of smooth pieces. It turns out if you look at equations for this, uh, well, to get equations is easy. You just uh, you take sort of inverse coordinates. You take uh, for for each x one, x two, x three, you you have another coordinate z, and you replace uh, x one by one over z one. 
and so on. And then you clear denominator. So you get uh, Z2, Z3 plus Z1, Z3 plus Z1, Z2 is equal to zero. Okay. So in general, you get, you get a, a, a quite singular, singular space. And, and, and I also draw some lines that you can see the other strata coming in. You can sort of see the, the, the way all the pieces fit together. Any questions? So it feels like this is in some sense the additive group version of a toric variety or something? I, I actually think of it a lot like that. It, it's, it's, um, it, it, it has a lot of flavor similarities to toric varieties and there are other, connect, there are other connections you can, you can um, uh, well, what, I, I'm gonna do some blow ups later and you can think of this blow up as sitting in, as, as doing some blow ups in P1 to the end, which gives you a toric variety. And then this is a closure inside that. But yeah, it, 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 it very much feels like toric geometry. Um, the only problem is that, that additive groups not being, not being reductive are much less useful either for algebraic geometry or for, or for topology. If you do equivariant cohomology, it's not very enlightening. So, um, so there, there, there are certain tools that naturally come with when people think about toric varieties that aren't applicable here, but nevertheless, it still is, um, it still is somewhat familiar if, you, if you've thought about toric varieties. And do these things have a name in the literature? Have they been studied for other purposes? Um, so uh, I don't know for other purposes. So th th this, this is uh, Nick Proudfoot, one of, one of my other collaborators on this project, uh, called them uh, Schubert varieties of arrangements, which has confused people because they're not, they're not Schubert varieties. They're just like Schubert varieties, given that they have uh, stratifications by affine spaces and so on. So, um, but that, that's, 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 uh, that's what I've heard them called, but um, yeah. Okay, so, so we have this array and, and it's the, the cohomology of a space. And it turns out that uh, with a little bit of work, we can, we, can we can use this to prove a theorem, uh, but to do that, we need to actually sort of work with the singularities. It, it, the, the, the cohomology ring of a, of a singular variety is in general not so well behaved, but uh, if we replace it by this uh, gadget called the intersection cohomology, which I'm not gonna try to define, um, but it's something which understands singularities of, of varieties in a, in, a, in a deeper way, such that it recovers some of the nice properties that you hope to have if the space were smooth. So, uh, in, in general, the things that I'll need is that it's a module over the cohomology and, and it will satisfy Poincare duality that there's a pairing between complementary degrees and in particular the complementary degrees have equal dimensions and the hard left shits, which is, which I'll uh, say in, in this diagram here. So hard left shits says that if you take uh, an ample class, which is uh, exactly the property that I wanted that the coefficients are, are positive when you write it out in this, in this basis, um, if you take an ample class in, in degree two, we have the degree, de degree doubling property. So instead of degree one, everything is in degree two when we're doing topology. Um, and you multiply by that class enough times to get from degree 2j to the complementary degree uh, 2d minus 2j, uh, then that's always an isomorphism. So the hard left statement says that if you have a class like this and you multiply enough times by this, by this element, you get this isomorphism. And uh, but now we have, we, so that's great, but we were actually interested in, in the cohomology, but the cohomology maps to the intersection cohomology simply because there's an element, there's a natural element one. I mean, in fact, in fact, in degree zero, these are equal. And so there's a, there's a, there's a unit element in, even though intersection cohomology is not a ring, there's still a unit element. And you can multiply, since it's a module over cohomology, you can take, uh, you can take, uh, you know, an, an element Y, and send it to y times one in, in intersection cohomology. So, so, so you have this map uh, and uh, an argument of uh, Bjorner and Ekedal, which they, which they use to prove theorems about Schubert varieties, uh, but, but, the, but the argument still holds for, for, for varieties we're talking about. So basically any variety that's uh, stratified by, by affine spaces, they show that this map is always injective. So the, so the cohomology, injects into the intersection cohomology for this kind of space. And that does the trick because uh, if the map on intersection cohomology is, um, is injective, sorry, is an isomorphism, and the map into 
intersection cohomology from cohomology is injective, then the composition is injective, and this map commutes because it's a module, because it's a module map, and so uh, and so the multiplication by this by this lambda from the uh, degree two j to degree two two d minus two j must be injective uh, on the cohomology. Okay. Um, and this, this exact argument was used by Bjorn et al. to prove inequalities between, uh, between the number of elements of a certain dimension below an element in a, in a Coxeter group using sort of, sort of using Schubert rights. So it was, it was, it was sort of a, it was an argument that was, that was already known that was, that was sort of waiting to be applied to this, to this new variety. Okay, so, so, so this, this, is, this is the basic, um, the basic gist of, of their proof. So, um, so now uh, what I want to talk about is a, well, actually, let, let, me, let me stop to see if there's any questions before I go to generalization of this. Oh, so, so, there, so, this, this, so this has been uh, defined in a, in a paper. Uh, I'll, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, I, think, I think Nick actually has seen this paper, but I, yeah. I'm, um, Nick, Nick, Nick is better at keeping track of, of, of the literature than I am. Tom, quick yes. mark. Uh, this injectivity shouldn't follow from the purity of the cohomology. Yes, I mean, it, it, yeah, the, the, it, it's absolutely it's 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 a mixed it's a statement about mixed Hodge theory that gives it that. But anyway, I, I mean, Bjorn Eck et al. is is the person who wrote wrote this out that that, that I knew it. I mean, this argument may have been may have been uh, occurred elsewhere. That that that's that's the place that I've seen it. So I think the cur the kernel is in the weight two uh, j minus one. Yeah, but, that's right. That's right. Yeah. No. I mean. I mean. It's not. It, it's. It's. It, I mean. They, they didn't. They didn't have. They. They. They just applied the machinery of mixed Hodge theory to, to, to prove this. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, yeah. Um, and the uh, purity in, uh, in this case is um, well known, right? What, yeah. What, what is behind it? Uh, well, so uh, the purity of intersection cohomology. Um, there's a nice resolution you can use. Um, uh, there. There is also, and and there's a there's a um, uh, there is a there is a one-dimensional torus acting, so you can't you can't play all the games you want to play with with torus actions, but but there is a one-dimensional torus that contracts down onto the singularity. So, um, yeah, so 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 you can get out of that. There, there, but um, okay. okay, so, but now I'm going to actually remove algebraic geometry from this by abstracting away from vector, vector configurations to, to matroids. And in fact, um, when I stated this conjecture, the top heavy conjecture, I actually didn't state the full conjecture because the full conjecture was not for vectors, it was for, for matroids, which is a general a sort of abstraction of, of vector configurations. So we're going to abstract away the actual vectors and only remember the pattern of subsets. So that 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 list of finite subsets that I that I wrote down is is sort of all that's left. So um, matroids have been around for a while. I guess they were originally defined by Whitney, and uh, I just uh, uh, Wikipedia told me that apparently they were independently uh, found by somebody called Nakasawa, who I have not not heard of before. But um, they're one of these sort of uh, uh, blind people in an elephant things that there's many different equivalent definitions using different different parts of the elephant. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give a definition that, that involves flats, but you can also define them in terms of independent sets or bases or rank function or circuits, and 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 then there's a fun game to play of proving that all these definitions are equivalent. But since I'm talking about flats in this talk, um, I'll give you a definition in terms of flats. So a matroid on a finite set, uh, which is basically your your indexing set of your vectors, is a collection of subsets of of your finite set. First of all, the whole collection has to be a flat. So these are going to be the flats. The whole collection has to be allowed. And then for any flat, if you take all the elements that are one step above that flat that are that are, that are that contain your flat but are not equal to it and there's nothing in between, um, then then if you then the elements you've added to get those form partition of all the elements that you could add. So each element occurs in exactly one of those uh, minimal covers of, of F. Um, so it turns out that, that, that it, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a good exercise in linear algebra to convince yourself that that's actually true for vector configurations. Um, but now, now we just take these as axioms and, uh, and it turns out that although vector, vector configurations give such collections of subsets, 
not all collections of subsets satisfying these axioms come from vector configurations. Um, yeah, so, so, so what I'm saying is the, these give a generalization of, of incidence geometry of, of vector configurations, but uh, most matroids are not realizable by vectors over any field. And I gave a couple of examples. Uh, one of the natural ones is the non-Pappus matroid here, where uh, Pappus' theorem, which is really a theorem in projective geometry, which is pure linear algebra, says that if all of these uh, collinearities uh, can, given by the blue lines are true, then there should be another blue line connecting these three points. But you can abstractly define a matroid where those three points are not collinear, where they don't define a flat, where rather there are rather there are three lines that rather these three points define a triangle and and you could have three three lines defining them not three lines defined by them not just one um and so there's no way in linear algebra to produce vectors that do that um but nevertheless it's a it's a valid matrix and it was proved a couple of years ago that in fact if you, if you look at the number of matroids on n elements, the number of realizable matroids, the, the fraction of realizable matroids realizable by uh, vectors over a field goes to zero. So in some, in some actual measurable sense, almost all matroids are not realizable. Okay. But if we don't have the vectors, then, then we don't have this fright. We, we, we don't have this space to talk about. Um, but nevertheless, um, with, a, with a fair amount of work, um, we managed to remove the algebraic geometry from the equation or simulate the algebraic geometry and prove the same theorem uh, without, without having to refer to this variety. Okay, so, uh, and, and for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll sort of talk around a little bit. Uh, I, I can't come anywhere close to explaining the proof, but um, I can sort of explain how, how I, because the proof is still inspired by geometry, even though we're not allowed to use the geometry. So, um, so yeah, so, so the goal is to simulate the ingredients that we had when there was algebraic geometry. Uh, and, and so we need to be able to compute or create uh, intersection cohomology associated to a matroid such that if, if it came from vectors, it would be the thing I already know how to do topologically. Um, but I need, to, I need to be able to produce it entirely from the properties of the matrix, so just from this finite set of finite subsets. Um, so the properties we need are, uh, well, it should be a graded module over this. So, so first of all, the cohomology ring, we already know how to define this, this graded Mobius algebra. So that, that, part is, that part was already done. Um, and we wanted to give the same answer as the intersection cohomology if we do have topology, if we do have vectors. Uh, and the map from cohomology to intersection cohomology should be injective. And it should satisfy Pronker duality, hard left shits. And well, Hodge Riemann, uh, we don't actually need for the, for the proof of this, but it comes, it comes as part of the induction. I'll, I'll discuss this in a little bit. But, but mainly we need the hard luscious property and we need the injectivity because that, that's exactly what we use. That's what Hu and Wang used to prove uh, the theorem for realizable matrix. Okay, so yeah, so th th this is kind of a, a, a known game that people have done in a couple of other situations, including uh, Coxeter groups and polytopes where they've taken a situation where um, there, there's algebraic geometry sometimes, but not always. And you can define interesting things when there is algebraic geometry and then figuring out ways to define it independent of the algebraic geometry. And, and in, in, in each case, the final step of actually proving that you get the right thing that does the right thing is, is surprisingly difficult, but, um, but getting the definition is, is reasonably natural. Okay, so yeah, so, so as I said, you want to compute or construct this intersection cohomology module as a module of, over the cohomology, but only using information that, that's associated to the matroid. So I'm not allowed to, I, I can imagine a fictional variety, but I can't actually use it. Um, so the, the, the pathway that we, we use to do this is, uh, is, well, if there is a variety, then there's a canonical resolution of singularities. Um, this, this is something that, that's, that's uh, not true for other interesting singular varieties, but in this case, there, there's, a, there's a more or less canonical 
um, resolution of singularities uh, that was actually studied or a family it includes a family of things studied by Feichter and Yuzvinsky. Um, and it's it's a it's a sequence of blowups. So in the case, in the example that I gave, you just have to blow up the, the, the unique singular point, um, which which means that you replace that point by one point for every line going through that point. It, it's always a conical singularity that it's a union of a bundle of lines through that point, and you replace each line with with an, a, a single point. Um, for higher dimensions, you have to inductively do that. You blow up the one dimensional things, you blow up the two dimensional things, and, and keep going. Okay. Um, and you get a much, a much larger variety, but it's a smooth variety with a lot of very, very nice geometry. It has normal crossings, divisors, and, and so on. So it's things that people understand a lot, a lot about. And, um, and, and, and in particular, it's cohomology is, 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 is again a nice combinatorial ring that we can define independently. Even if there wasn't topology, we can still write down the, 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 the ring. So the, ring, the, the cohomology of this resolution uh, will now have generators corresponding to each of the flats that you blew up, each of the, each of the strata that you blew up. And then you'll have a generator just for the rank one flats. Um, and those money multiply will give things of, of higher rank. And it has three kinds of relations. Uh, first of all, if the flats are not comparable, the, the corresponding generators give zero. And uh, for uh, a rank one element that's not contained in a flat, the, the corresponding y times the corresponding generator x is, is zero. And finally, actually, you can eliminate the y's entirely by the last relation, except that it's much nicer to write it with them. Uh, that in fact the y's are actually the sum of all the of all the x's that are but that are not contained in the flat. That, that so all the xf's for the flats that do not contain i. Um, okay, so it, it's a much bigger ring than h. It, it doesn't have a nice basis. Uh, I mean, you can you can define a basis, uh, a combinatorial basis, um, uh, but uh, but it, it's much trickier. You have to the basis corresponds to chains of elements. Of a certain type in the in the in the post set rather than individual elements. Um, okay, but nevertheless, there's a homomorphism uh, of of this ring uh, uh, from from the cohomology to the cohomology of the resolution. Well, in topology, you know there would be one, but in this case, we can define it purely algebraically, uh, just sending the generator y i to the generator y i in in this bigger ring. And but it's 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 um, it takes a fair amount of work to prove that this is a ring homomorphism. Uh, because you, you then have to figure out what the other YFs are. It turns out that YF is the product of the YIs for any subset, which is a basis for that flat. Um, and, and you have to show that it satisfies the, the correct relations uh, and, and, show that it, and show that its injective is not trivial. So all of those things take, take a bit of work to prove. Um, but they are true for any matroid. And, uh, and uh, I think it was June's idea, he, he, we, we end up calling this the Chow ring of the matroid because um, this ring can also be realized as the Chow ring of a certain algebraic variety, but, that, but when, the, when the matroid is not realizable, the variety that is a Chow ring of is not complete. So it, so it, turns, out to be a, a, it turns out to be a ring that has prong duality and looks like a smooth thing, but it's, it can be constructed as the Chow ring of, of something of the wrong dimension that's not complete. Um, anyhow, so we have this larger ring, um, but we're, what we're in, really interested in is the intersection cohomology. And we find that because, uh, again, if there were topology, we would have another big heavy hammer, the uh, decomposition theorem of Bounds and Bernstein, Delinia and Gaber, says that, uh, that the cohomology of this resolution, this big, this big ring with the x's and y's, should be a direct sum as a module over the cohomology of the thing I want, which is the intersection cohomology, plus a bunch of other stuff, which is of the same type. I, I don't need to go in, into, into the exact definition, but it'll be a direct sum as a module. And further in this situation, it turns out that the intersection, the thing that I want, the intersection cohomology, is actually an indecomposable module. So it can't split up more. So if I split up this big thing, in, into, uh, into its indecomposable sum ends, one of them will be the thing that I want. And by Kroll-Schmidt, the things, that, the things that decompose it into are unique up to permutation. And so I just need to find the one I want. And it turns out that 
the, the one that I want is the unique one that contains the thing in degree zero. Um, because the, the, the degree zero part is one dimensional. So there's a unique, there's a unique sum n that hits that piece and that will be the module that I want. Okay. Um, so that's an abstract definition, which is theoretically correct, but it's hard to work with because the direct sum decomposition is not unique. So, so, so to find the thing you want and actually prove that it has the properties turns out to be rather, rather daunting. Uh, and in this situation, which is unlike some of the other situations that I've seen this kind of stuff done, we, we actually were able to define a canonical decomposition that we actually found this submodule, we defined it canonically as a submodule of this, of this, of this ring. Um, the, paper, the paper of Ginsburg is the, uh, that I'm referring to is the perverse sheaves and C star actions. Um, so so the, basically, if, if you look at, it's saying that the Homs are, are isomorphic to Homs over, over, the, over the cohomology ring, and that turns in, you can, from that, you can deduce the indecomposability of this module. Okay, so, okay, so, 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 so this, is, this is the module I want to do. I'm not going to actually give you the definition of the unique, sub, of the canonical submodule to give it. It's a, it's a little involved. It, it has a lot of, there's a, a lot of inductive push and pull maps, and we define it as a perpendicular space to a bunch of, we, we define the other stuff kind of inductively by knowing what we've done from the previous, from lower rank matroids and then, and then find the model we want as a perp space of that. But, um, okay. But in the end, so what we're able to prove uh, by a, a really nasty, really intricate induction on the number of elements in my ground set, we can prove that, um, that this intersection cohomology module satisfies Poincare duality. So there's, there's a non-degenerate pairing uh, from degree j to degree d, d minus j. And the pairing just comes because it's sitting inside this ring, this chow ring, uh, which, is, which does satisfy Poincare duality. So the pairing is, is sort of just induced from that inclusion. Um, and there's a hard left uh, map that it's a module over the, over the Mobius algebra h of m. And so if I take an element lambda with positive coefficients and I multiply by the, right, uh, by the amount to get from from below the middle to, to above the middle, um, you get an isomorphism. And that immediately says that we can use the same argument and that proves a top heavy conjecture. Okay. But we prove a few other things along the way, which are in our proof are inextricably part of the induction. We, we were not able to prove those first two statements without proving all of, without proving the three and four and five that are on the next slide as part of the, part of the induction. So we also prove the hodge riemann inequalities, which says that if you look at the kernel, so going from j to d minus j is an isomorphism, but if you go one step further, when you, if you multiply by one more lambda, uh, you can look at the kernel of that. And on that kernel, um, you get a pairing, which is go, go to the complementary degree and take the pairing and then multiply an appropriate sign, and that's positive definite. So it tells you something about the, the, the signature of, of that pair. And, and these are all things that are true for, for algebraic varieties, but we're able to prove them, again, purely, purely combinatorially. Um, there's also a, a, a local degree vanishing, which is if you take this module and you mod out by the action of all of the positive degree parts of, of this Mobius algebra, um, there's something that remains. And that something that remains topologically is the local intersection cohomology stock at the singular point. Um, and that should, by, if you know something about intersection cohomology, it should vanish in degrees above the middle. And we're able to prove that that's, that's true for this, this module. Um, and finally, um, we're also able to prove a rigidity statement, which is that this module doesn't have interesting endomorphisms as a graded module, except for just multiplication by scalars, which means that even if you took the, the first definition I gave, which is just an abstract direct sum and with a certain property, it's still, reason, it's still basically canonical that if I do something using this module, uh, build up some maps and multiplications and, and kernels and co-kernels, whatever I do will be intrinsically defined in terms of the matroid. It won't, it won't, it won't have any, any, uh, any dependency on choices. Um, so it really is in the end, even though we have to cut it out of this, you know, carve it out of this big complicated block in a, in, a, in a difficult way, once we have it, it's really, it really is intrinsically associated to the, to the matroid. Um, okay, any questions?
By the way, I, I, I never asked, so, so is, is this a 50 minute talk or an hour? Or what, 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 when, when am I expected to wrap up? Um, uh, it's completely up to you. Um, okay. uh, some people talk for 50 minutes, some people talk for an hour. It's completely up to you. Okay, I, I, I think it'll probably be somewhere in between that, but I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm getting toward the end, so. Sure. Okay, so, um, so, so that, that, that completes what I'm gonna say about the, the, the top heavy conjecture, but, but we actually get some, some, more, some more stuff out of this because the actual intersection cohomology itself has been of interest uh, besides, besides its use in, in, this, uh, in this way to prove top heaviness. So um, a paper of Elias Proudfoot and Wakefield uh, were considering the, the, this local intersection cohomology stock of this singular variety Y, and they proved that it can be computed again purely combinatorially in terms of this matroid uh, post set of flats. So they gave a formula for for this, uh, which which computes this local intersection cohomology dimensions. Uh, you know, again purely combinatorially, and they define it. They 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 call it the the cosinalistic polynomial of a matroid, which again, as terms of terminology, has confused a lot of people because these are not cosinalistic polynomials. In the usual sense, they are just analogous to cosmological polynomials um, in, in some ways, although not analogous in others. So mainly they come from an intersection cohomology of something that looks a bit like a Schubert variety. Um, so um, I'm going to give you a quick definition of these polynomials, which is not the original one, but it's, it's a little easier to state. Um, so these polynomials are uniquely characterized by uh, a, um, uh, uh, a sort of base zero, base case, which is just if the, if the rank of the matroid is zero, then you get one. For any other matroid, there's a degree vanishing, which is that uh, the degree should be less than half the rank. Uh, and finally, if you add up over all flats, um, the, the, the polynomial corresponding to a, what's called a contraction of the matroid, which is basically, it's basically the partial order set where you start from F and you go, you take everything above F. Um, so that, that would be the partial order set that you're looking at. And, and you take all those cosmological polynomials and multiply by, by the rank. And this, this polynomial should be, should be palindromic. And, and, and if you, if you think about this, this actually uniquely character, uniquely defines polynomials because this sum will contain uh, you can you can assume by induction that you've computed the all of these for uh, for matroids of smaller rank, and then the only term in the sum that you haven't seen is p of m itself times times one, and and then in order for this to be palindromic, and for and for this to be degree less than the middle, then there's only one thing that that you can add to make to get a a, a palindromic answer. Okay, so so this is this is the uh, um, yeah, if you look at the original paper, this is not the definition they gave, but this is uh, equivalent to it and a little bit easier to state. Um, so uh, in our paper, we're able to show that this, that this local module, this quotient by the action of the positive degree generators of, of, of H of M does satisfy exactly these recurrences uh, with, with sort of module versions of these. Um, and in particular, like the, the, the degree vanishing is exactly that I that I stated on the previous slide is exactly what gives you this uh, degree vanishing of this polynomial, uh, and therefore uh, this polynomial is the Poincaré polynomial of this local module, and that proves that these coefficients are non-negative, which was conjectured but not proved in the original original paper. So they were able to find this polynomial, but it was an open question uh, when they defined it: Are the you know is this a non-negative? Do they have non-negative coefficients? And now we have an interpretation of them as dimensions of spaces, you know, graded spaces of this module. Okay. And for the last few minutes, I want to just say a little bit about these polynomials because they have some, some, some nice properties. Um, so I just want to talk about the, uh, uh, this, this, is, this is my last slide, um, low degree coefficients of this polynomial are, are kind of nice. Well, the, the degree zero, the constant coefficient is always one. That's, that's just trivial. Uh, but the coefficient of t in this polynomial is the number of d minus one flats minus the what minus minus the number of uh, rank one flats, and that's our that's that's a familiar friend from the beginning. Well, it's a special case of the top-heavy conjecture, but in fact, it's 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 something that was known back in back in '68. So the non-negativity of that coefficient is is you know well known. But already, if you look at the t squared coefficient, actually actually even before I look at the t squared coefficient, 
even even if you just if 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 all you care about is a the non-negativity, then then you're done. But in fact, if you care about vector spaces, and because these vector spaces are canonically associated with the matroid, there's interesting juice to get out of them. Um, if you actually work out where this IH1M, uh, this sort of stock module is in degree one, uh, it turns out to be the co-kernel of a matrix ranked uh, of rank D minus one, uh, in indexed by rank D minus one times uh, rank one flats. And the entry corresponding to a D minus one flat comma of rank one flat is one if they are not contained in each other and zero if they are. It's kind of a non-incidence matrix. And, uh, and, and I found in the literature that this matrix was already considered by matroid theorists. Kung wrote a paper. So there was a, mainly he was interested in the opposite matrix where you have zero if they, one if they are contained and zero if they are. He, he called this a, a matroid radon transform. But he did in, in, in one, of, one of the parts of this show that if you flip them, uh, that this matrix has the full rank which is in this case, the smaller number, the, 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 the number of rank one flats. And therefore it's co-kernel has the dimension that we think it does. Um, but anyway, I, 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 thought it was, I thought it was nice to see that, 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 that naturally this, this, this matrix naturally drops out of this module. Um, you could almost, from what I've told you, you could almost do this computation. Um, uh, actually, I think if you, if you knew something about the Poincare pairing, I think, I think you could do it. Um, but uh, but, but this, this matrix was already, was already considered. Uh, also, just a note is that this matrix only has full rank for fields of characteristic zero. Uh, so if I did the same thing with intersection cohomology of positive characteristic coefficients, this fails and you can, you can see it failing by looking at these matrices. And finally, the, the degree two coefficient, the, the stories diverge because the coefficient of degree two can be written as a, 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 sum, a, 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 a sum of plus or minus some six terms uh, the first two are Whitney numbers like before, and they are uh, symmetric Whitney numbers, which by, uh, by top heaviness would be non-negative. But the other terms are now, instead of counting flags, they're counting chains of flags. So, so this would count uh, a rank one flat, flat contained in a rank two flat, and a rank one flat contained in a rank D minus one flat, and so on. Um, and still, if you, if you fix the rank one flat, then this looks like a sort of symmetric difference, except the order is now the, the bigger one, the, the lower degree, degree one is now positive. So this one is actually not less than or equal to zero by top heaviness. And the, and the last one is, is like greater than or equal to zero. So, that, so the non-negativity non of this one does not follow. Uh, it's, it's neither, the, the, neither one implies the other um, in this case. Um, but but these, these combinations seem to, seem to have interesting properties, which I, um, um, above t squared, they get sort of too complicated to see patterns, but um, um, I'm still hoping to, to ring out some interesting information from the t squared uh, case and, and see that it, see if it relates to things that, that matroid theorists already think about or would be interested in thinking about. Okay, so I will stop there and see if there's any questions. Oh, very nice. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, so we're open for questions. Can I ask a question about the algebraic geometry? Yes. Uh, I guess I was around slide 10 or something. Um, don't remember the exact number. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, what is the special property of these varieties that allows them to have these, these wonderful resolutions? Uh, so there, um, I, so first of all, the singularities are conical. So if you blow them up and they're sort of iteratively conical. So, so if you blow up the first, the, the most singular point, you're just, you're just taking the, the, you know, the fiber is just the corresponding projective variety that's the cone over that. And now, uh, the, the proper transform of the rank one flats in that will also have, will, will also be, be um, you know, have conical singularities all along it. So, so it's sort of it's sort of inductive, and you can see this because if you look at the variety sitting inside p one to the n, if you blow up p one to the n inductively, you blow up first the infinity, 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 and then you blow up sort of the transforms of each of the the, the corresponding uh, sort of uh, you know 
products of it, 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 coordinates where infinities are, are a certain number of coordinates or infinity. Um, it, it, it's that that has a nice sort of nested inductive structure in the same way. Um, I, I don't know an abstract algebraic geometric version of, of what I just said, but that's that's what that's what happens. Right. And then I guess I had a completely unrelated question, and that's uh, how is this related to to her and other people's work on um, log concavity and unimodality and that sort of thing? Right. So like the auto procedure who and cats and so on. So um, well, so there was an early work of of her that used different geometry, but the, the AHK paper did use actually not quite this Y paper. What they used is the projective version, which is the fiber of the, the fiber of the map Y tilde to Y over the, over the singular point infinity, infinity, infinity. So, so, uh, so that, that, that first blow up, that variety would be, would be that, that one. And it, it has, um, and, and, and they were dealing with the smooth version. So they proved the Hodge package, the Hodge Riemann package for that that singular variety, which also is a nice is a nice variety sitting inside some torque blow up. Um, so they have sort of some similar inductive inductive schema. But uh, so we we it one of the ingredients in our proof is either either a result from AHK or we actually came up with another an independent proof of the of the main results of AHK using some of the things we were discovered along the way. But that comes into, you, you, you need to prove things about the smooth case before you can prove things about the singular case. And so their chowering is different from the chowering here. Is that right? Uh, that's right. That, so their, their, their chowering is, is, the, is, is what, in our paper, we call it the underlying chowering. Every, everything that involves the fiber over, over infinity, 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 we, we, we denote with an underlying in, in our, and, and so that, that 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 corresponds to the AHK thing. Uh, so their version, their their version would be if you take our chow ring and mod out by all of the Ys. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, so and, this, does this imply this result then imply the other result or? Um, well, you would need you, you you need you need their result to get it. So it would be a circle. But um, and 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 this result is much more difficult. Um, in fact, I, I mean, I, I, actually, I I I. Um, let me. Uh, the, 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 this is a, a a diagram of the structure of our induction proof. Uh, so it, it it it's it's really really complicated. It involves ping back and forth between the sort of global and local between the between the y and the and the underlying and the and the fiber over this and and proving all these Hadriemann hard left shifts and so on. And uh, most of the time you can only do up to the middle degree, and then you have to later come back and do the middle degree. Um, it was extremely intricate, um, but so yeah. So it it doesn't it doesn't it absolutely it it relies on those early results or new proofs of those early results. But it doesn't it doesn't uh, yeah. You couldn't use it to prove it. Um, yeah. Thanks. I actually have a similar question. Mm -hmm. um, there's um there are some cases as you mentioned, like in coxeter groups and in polytopes, where uh, some algebraic version of intersection homology has been constructed where the variety doesn't exist. There right. must be there must be some overlap between the problems you consider and the problems they consider in some special cases. Is there any any situation where where these two uh, constructions might be compared with each other? Uh, let's see. These varieties are never toric varieties unless they're P one. I think. Oh, I, see. I don't know. I don't know what the intersection between these and Schubert rides would be. There might be a few, but I wouldn't think it would be a very large class. Yeah, it's um, not very big. Yeah, um, and 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 in general, like like th those proofs uh, for toric varieties and, and Schubert varieties, um, the there there are some interesting similarities, but some 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 real differences because the combinatorics are really different. So like we 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 end up using semi-small resolutions and and sort of push forwards like that, but it's exactly the opposite of what you have in Schubert varieties, where the thing that's the, in, in the semi-small resolution for for Schubert varieties, the thing upstairs is something you understand inductively because it's a P1 bundle over a smaller Schubert variety. For us, inductively, the thing downstairs is the thing we already understand because it's a smaller matroid, and we use that to deduce things upstairs. So they're like familiar characters playing completely different roles. 
in the in the structure of the induction. So it was it was it was it was a very frustrating. Like we we think we know what to do, and then we don't. We know what the we know what the ingredients are, but it was it was yeah. It, we had to make it up as we went along. So um, and and that really comes from the geometry that 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 really like there isn't a Hecke algebra here that we know of. There isn't the same sort of multiply by simple reflection and induct kind of thing. What there is is you can delete a hyperplane, and you can uh, and, and you can uh, take upper 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 in, upper postsets and lower postsets and that kind of thing you can induct on. But it's just a different it's a different combinatorics which requires a totally different method of proof. Also, if I remember correctly, there's this famous theorem of Polo that like every polynomial can be a cosmos two polynomial. Yes. But cosmos two polynomials and matroids are actually extremely constrained. Yeah, I don't I don't know how much we know. So well, first of all, they they I mean they if, if the if the linear coefficient is zero, then the whole thing is zero. Uh, I, do we know other constraints than that or no, I don't remember, but <laughs> it didn't seem like you could do very much. I mean, certainly when we looked at tables, they're 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 very different than than cosmological listing polynomials. But I I don't I don't have a, a, a exact way of saying how they're different. Tom, can I ask you a question? So first of all, thank you. That was that was a beautiful talk. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you. So so what you're doing takes place in two rings: the this this Chow ring and this intersection homology ring. And and for the Chow ring, you have a very nice combinatorial presentation. Well, the intersection homology is not a ring; it's a module. But yeah. Um, oh, sorry, um, but uh, but I was wondering to, to what extent do you explicit? I mean, it sounds like the, the at least the first definition of the intersection homology ring of an arbitrary matroid is kind of indirect, and I'm wondering to what extent do you understand? I don't know, like generators and relations or something like this. Well, again, it's a it's a module, so it's going to be it's going to be really difficult to define sort of generators and relations. You could try to present, you could try to you could try to do give synergies as modules over the over the over H of M, but. Yeah, I mean, I think in some small cases you might get somewhere, um, and uh, like I, I actually so so I, I I told you for that degree one coefficient how to write down a complex. I can actually write down a, a similar complex for the degree two coefficient that comes from thinking carefully about that. But but in higher degrees, it, 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 there's a sort of inductive complexity to it that I don't immediately I don't see how to give a a, a, a flat definition that just says this is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we, we really have to sort of carve it out of the Chow, the Chow ring as, you know, piece by piece by carving out the things corresponding to one flat and the next flat and going dimension by dimension and then showing that it, it, it satisfies the properties that you need. I guess I ask you because in, in, in some of these earlier settings, when, when you impose an order on the matroid, then there's all this theory of ordered matrix where there's like these internal activities, external activities, and some mm -hmm. the combinatorics can handle that, that kind of recursive complexity. I, I wonder if you've tried that or... Uh, we haven't. I don't. You know. I mean. I mean. I, I. I would be really interested if there were ways to remove some of the complexity of this argument. And and I. I certainly hope that there'll be other ways to see it uh, as as time goes on. But I don't. I don't know of any. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker again. Absolutely beautiful talk, Tom. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> hope to see you. Hope to see you here sometime. Yeah. Uh, can I ask more questions? Or, I don't know how this works. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll stick around for a while. We can I just, maybe stop the recording. I don't know. I just,